Yeah, okay. See what I do? I'm recording a photograph, so I'll know that's where I... Hi, my name is Philip Flager. I'm a retired electronic technician living in Cupertino, California. I am reading from a legal memo written by John Yu and signed by Assistant Attorney General Jay Bybee. The August 1st, 2002 memo addresses the proposed interrogation of a detainee named Abu Zubaydah. Hi, my name is Diane Raymond. I am a photographer who lives in Santa Cruz, California. I am reading from Abu Zubaydah's first-hand account of his interrogation in a secret CIA prison. He gave this testimony to the International Committee of the Red Cross. You have asked for this office's views on whether certain proposed conduct would violate the prohibition against torture found at Section 2340A of Title 18 of the United States Code. You have asked for this advice in the course of conducting interrogations of Abu Zubaydah. In light of the information you believe Zubaydah has and the high level of threat you believe now exists, you wish to move the interrogations into what you have described as an increased pressure phase. This phase will likely last no more than several days, but could last up to 30 days. About two and a half or three months after I arrived in this place, the interrogation began again, but with more intensity than before. Then the real torturing started. In this phase, you'd like to employ 10 techniques that you believe will dislocate his expectations regarding the treatment he believes he will receive and encourage him to disclose the crucial information mentioned above. These 10 techniques are one, attention grasp, two, walling, three, facial hold, four, facial slap, insult slap, five, cramped confinement, six, wall standing, seven, stress positions, eight, sleep deprivation, nine, insects placed in a confinement box, and 10, the waterboard. You have informed us that you expect these techniques to be used in some sort of escalating fashion, cumulating with the waterboard, though not necessarily ending with this technique. Two black wooden boxes were brought into the room outside my cell. One was tall, slightly higher than me, and narrow, perhaps measuring one meter by three quarters of a meter and two meters in height. The other was shorter, perhaps only one meter in height. I was taken out of my cell and one of the interrogators wrapped a towel around my neck. Then they used it to swing me around and smash me repeatedly against the hard walls of the room. I was also repeatedly slapped in the face. As I was still shackled, the pushing and pulling around meant that the shackles pulled painfully on my ankles. Cramped confinement involves the placement of the individual in a confined space, the dimensions of which restrict the individual's movement. The confined space is usually dark. The duration of confinement varies based on the size of the container. For the larger confined space, the individual can stand up or sit down. The smaller space is large enough for the subject to sit down. Confinement in the larger space can last up to 18 hours. For the smaller space, confinement lasts for no more than two hours. I was then put in the tall box for what I think was about one and a half hours to two hours. The box was totally black on the inside as well as the outside. It had a bucket inside to use as a toilet and had water to drink provided in a bottle. They put a cloth cover over the outside of the box to cut out the light and restrict my air supply. It was difficult to breathe. For walling, a flexible false wall will be constructed. The individual is placed with his heels touching the wall. The interrogator pulls the individual forward and then quickly and firmly pushes the individual into the wall. It is the individual's shoulder blades that hit the wall. During this motion, the head and neck are supported with a rolled hood or towel that supports a seat collar effect to help prevent whiplash. To further reduce the probability of injury, the individual is allowed to rebound from the flexible wall. 
You have orally informed us that the false wall is in part constructed to create a loud sound when the individual hits it, which will further shock or surprise the individual. When I was let out of the box, I saw that one of the walls of the room had been covered with plywood sheeting. From now on, it was against this wall that I was then smashed with the towel around my neck. I think that the plywood was there to provide some sort of absorption of the impact of my body. The interrogators realized that smashing me hard against the wall would probably quickly result in physical injury. During these torture sessions, many guards were present. Plus, two interrogators who did the actual beating, still asking questions, which the main interrogator left to return when the beating was over. After the beating, I was then placed in the small box. They placed a cloth or cover over the box to cut out all light and restrict my air supply. As it was not high enough to even to, to sit upright, I had to crouch down. It was very difficult because of my wounds. The wound on my leg began to open and started to bleed. I don't know how long I remained in the small box. I think I have may, maybe have slept or maybe fainted. Finally, you would like to use a technique called the waterboard. In this procedure, the individual is bound securely to an inclined bench, which is approximately four feet by seven feet. The individual's feet are generally elevated. A cloth is placed over the forehead and eyes. Water is then applied to the cloth in a controlled manner. As this is done, the cloth is lowered until it covers the nose and mouth. Once the cloth is saturated and completely covers the mouth and nose, airflow is slightly restricted for 20 to 40 seconds due to the presence of the cloth. This causes an increase in carbon dioxide level in the individual's blood. The increase in the carbon dioxide level stimulates increased effort to breathe. I was then dragged from the small box, unable to walk properly and put on what looked like a hospital bed and strapped down very tightly with belts. A black cloth was then placed over my face and the interrogators used a mineral water bottle to pour water on the cloth so that I could not breathe. After a few minutes, the cloth was removed and the bed was rotated into an upright position. The pressure of the straps on my wounds was very painful. I vomited. You have orally informed us that this procedure triggers an automatic physiological sensation of drowning that the individual cannot control even though he may be aware that he is in fact not drowning. I struggled against the straps trying to breathe, but it was hopeless. I thought I was going to die. I lost control of my urine. Since then, I still lose control of my urine when under stress. In order for pain or suffering to rise to the level of torture, the statute requires that it be severe. Although the confinement boxes, both small and large, are physically uncomfortable because their size restricts movement, they are not so small as to require the individual to contort his body to sit or stand. I was then placed in the tall box. While I was inside the box, loud music was played again, and somebody kept banging repeatedly on the box from the outside. I tried to sit on the floor, but because of the small space, the bucket with urine tipped over and spilt over me. I, returned in the I remained in the box for several hours, maybe overnight. No pain, even approaching severe pain, results. I was then taken out and again a towel was wrapped around my neck and I was smashed into the wall and repeatedly slapped in the face by the same two interrogators as before. I was then made to sit on the floor with a black hood over my head until the next session of torture began. As we explain in the section 2340A memorandum, pain and suffering is best understood as a single concept, not distinct concepts of pain as distinguished from suffering. This went on for approximately one week. During this time, the whole procedure was repeated five times. The waterboard, which inflicts no pain or actual harm whatsoever, does not, in our view, inflict severe pain or suffering. On each occasion, 
I was suffocated once or twice and was put in the vertical position on the bed in between. On one occasion, the suffocation was repeated three times. I vomited each time. Even if one were to treat suffering as a distinct concept, the waterboard could not be said to inflict severe suffering. I collapsed and lost consciousness on several occasions. Eventually, the torture was stopped by the intervention of the doctor. The waterboard is simply a controlled acute episode. I was told during this period that I was one of the first to receive these interrogation techniques, so no rules applied. It felt like they were experimenting and trying out techniques to be used later on other people. I'm Diane Raymond. My name is Philip Flager. I'm a retired electronic technician from Cupertino, California. I'm a veteran from the Vietnam era. Presently, I'm the chapter contact for Veterans for Peace Chapter 101 in San Jose. And we're recording this session at the San Jose Peace and Justice Center because it's the place where individuals and groups gather to promote peace and justice. Reckoning with torture is important because the United States must stop torture. The first step in stopping torture is to acknowledge that we actually torture. When I enlisted into the Air Force in 1962, I believed the United States did not torture. Now I find that we torture openly. By reading these words of the victims, the torturers, and the interrogators, we will bring this to light and show it to the public, and they can no longer deny that we torture. And torture is a uh, moral, morally reprehensible. It's against, it's illegal you know, against international law and any moral discipline. We must stop torturing.